Good afternoon all and uh, welcome to our uh, WMG Steel Research Group Colloquium. And uh, today we have a great speaker, Peter uh, Jeslistein from Syntex Limited, Denmark. Um, Peter graduated from the Danish Technical University in 1999 as Master of Science in Chemical Engineering. In 2014, he also graduated with an MBA in Innovation. He has been working with spray forming of uh, high alloyed tool steels from 1999 to 2006 uh, and been developing uh, and innovating new alloys and processes within the world of powder metallurgy at Syntex since 2007. Peter is active in the European Metal Powder Association, EPMA, where he is chairing a community within functional materials. Furthermore, he is also active as board member of the Danish Metallurgical Society and teaching within metallurgy and innovation as guest teacher at several Danish universities. Lately, he has initiated a video podcast on metallurgy, trying to show the need for material science in our future society. Today, Peter is going to deliver a talk on metal powder extrusion of advanced alloys. Peter, thank you very much for uh, taking your time to present this talk and floor is yours. So a little about me. Uh, that's how I look uh, when when you turn 50. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, get gray hair or gray beard and not that much hair. Um, Syntex, we are produced in Denmark uh, in the northern part of Jutland. Uh, Syntex is a pure Danish company, only uh, manufacturing locally. So everything is under the same roof, uh, development, sales, uh, production. Um, so we are very close to each other and that makes uh, the process very agile. What we do is uh, uh, metal powder products. Uh, so what you see here on the screen are components made uh, with standard uniaxial compaction. Uh, it's filters uh, where particle size is a bit higher. Uh, and to the upper right, you see injection molding parts. Uh, everything is stainless steel. Uh, our core competences is uh, to produce stainless steel uh, with high corrosion resistance. A little about what powder metal is. Uh, because uh, when, when you work with metal powder, uh, you typically start with very fine uh, particles. Uh, you can have water atomized particles, which are not very spherical. They are very spongy and uh, fractional in, in the surface geometry, and they can easily be compacted together. You deform them into each other and they have a certain level of strength. But uh, what I will talk about to, uh, today is uh, what we call gas atomized powders. Uh, and as you can see on the, the photos here, typical particle size is between zero and 20 microns. So they're very fine. Uh, and the applications where they're typically used is uh, metal injection molding is the, the old guy in the class. Uh, Isostatic pressing, so it could be hot, hot isostatic press or cold isostatic pressing. Uh, it's also used for filters. For filters, it's typically larger particles than shown on, on the photos here. Then the not newcomer in class, but one of the newcomers is additive manufacturing. Uh, it has been on the street for, uh, I would say, 15 years. Uh, first with laser additive manufacturing and, and lately with uh, binded uh, jetting where uh, particles are glued together and afterwards uh, sintered. So the additive manufacturing today with the binded jet is a lot closer to uh, what we have done in, in metal injection molding for many years. So I would say additive manufacturing is just the new boring glass uh, with, with powder metal. Uh, but then the latest leg is uh, our metal powder extrusion that uh, I'll, I'll tell a little more about uh, later. Then a little about 
how the metallurgy in, in the world of scarcity, uh, because this is really uh, a, a big movement. Uh, majority of parts made with powder metals in Europe today are into cars. And uh, the automotive industry are uh, very much looking into uh, energy consumption and material consumption. And if you look at the, the left figure, it shows uh, the uh, raw material utilization, where powder metallurgy is 95%, or I would say what we do is typically higher than 95% in, in usage rates, uh, where some of the other processes, uh, you have a lot of scrap. Uh, so this is especially when we work, work with uh, stainless steel, uh, that contains uh, uh, nickel, which has just been put on the scarcity list in Europe. Uh, the utilization is extremely important. Then if we look at the other side to, to the right, you see uh, the energy consumption, where uh, uh, when, when you make it in the kilos you get out of it, it it's in fact the opposite of what you saw on the other side, because machining, you you use a lot of energy and you only get half the kilos out of it compared to uh, to powder metallurgy. Uh, so the energy input at the beginning might be the same, but the amount output is double uh, in powder metallurgy com compared to machining. So these are some of the features that makes it extremely interesting to to look into powder metallurgy as a process route. Uh, for, for for making sustainable products and uh, reduce the uh, resources uh, and, and use of scarcity materials. And now we go into the uh, the new process, the, the powder extrusion. Uh, I brought some pictures of uh, a traditional Danish uh, cookie that is made in uh, Christmas time. It's called a bus. Uh, because it, when it's baked, it, it looks like a bus. Uh, but as you can see, you put the, the clay at the top uh, up here. Then you uh, turn the handle and a product is pressed out. So this is traditional old uh, extrusion. It's not something we invented uh, lately. Uh, we started uh, working with extrusion in 2011 at Syntex. Uh, the first trials was uh, at uh, uh, the Danish University in Aarhus, where I had uh, three students uh, making uh, some trials. Uh, and uh, we couldn't afford a, a machine as the one you see on the right, uh, because that had a cost uh, about double the amount of money I had in our R&D budget. Uh, so therefore, we went out and we buy uh, uh, a meat processing machine. Uh, and uh, as the, the first feedstock we made needed to be heated, uh, it was based on agar. And agar is uh, a natural product that uh, has a glass uh, transition phase around 60 degrees. So therefore, uh, in order to make uh, the process work, uh, we needed to heat up the, uh, uh, the meat grinder uh, with heating elements. So therefore, it's, uh, it's isolated here. And uh, I'll, I'll try to play the video. And here you can see that uh, it works. So this is the world's first uh, metal uh, product ever made in uh, in metal power extrusion in a meat machine to a price of around uh, 500 euros. Now they're regulating the speed. So you see, it looks pretty nice. Yep. So the first application we look for was uh, for filtration, because back in 2011, there were uh, several projects where uh, diesel cars had problems with uh, particles going out into the environment. 
uh, we had companies making filters uh, of cauterite or silicium carbide, as you see to the upper uh, right. We had also companies making it with uh, tape casted metal sheets that were folded and welded together. But a system like, like that one at the bottom uh, was extremely difficult to make and, and very expensive. Uh, and there were also people making filters with uh, uh, isotelic pressing, as the ones you see here on, on the uh, left. So therefore, we looked into making filters uh, with metal power extrusion. Uh, so combining the structure you see in the cauterite with the uh, and cauterite is a ceramic material, uh, but combining the structures you have in the surface area with the metal structures we have in in the tip carton material below. Uh, but uh, when uh, we made uh, the first uh, trials, we called all the automotive uh, producers in, in Europe and asked them for uh, what kind of technology they believed in. And uh, 20 out of 21 said, that they would continue with the silicium carbide uh, solution. So uh, it was a, a big no thanks to uh, to the Centex uh, stainless steel based solution. So that was the first uh, resistant we saw. Uh, but uh, then we looked into uh, what else could we use this for? And as we were still Stuck in the automotive industry, we looked at this as a potential crash absorber in, in cars. Uh, and as you can see in the photo, um, the, the geometry looks uh, pretty nice today compared to the one the students made back in 2011. Um, yeah. But why should we go into making uh, crash absorbers because they already have crash absorbers. Uh, but we are uh, also looking into reduction of uh, carbon emission and carbon emission in, in the automotive industry uh, is, is pretty high. It's 12 percent of the European carbon emission that comes from cars. Uh, and the majority of, uh, of why it is still growing is that cars are getting uh, more and more heavy. And if we look at what the target is, uh, the target is to reduce the exhaust from 1990 with 90% uh, down to uh, almost nothing in 2050. So we, we really need to do some changes. Uh, and I call that the weight problem. It's not uh, uh, the weight problem we typically see uh, in, in our homes, uh, but it is uh, the weight problem of cars. Because the more uh, you put into a car, the more luxury part you put in, the more safety part you put in, the more better uh, you put in, the heavier uh, a, a car becomes. And if we look back uh, 30, 40 years, the typical weight of a car was around 800 kilos. But uh, as you can see here today, the weight of a car is uh, more or less 1.4 ton. So therefore, we are driving around with a lot of uh, kilos that uh, does harm the environment. If we could reduce the weight of a car back to 1,000 kilos, uh, the, the weight reduction alone could give us 40% in the re reduction of, of carbon emission. So that was the uh, the target for looking into uh, making crash absorbers out of of uh, twip steel uh, because crap crash absorbers they already exist uh, as you can see here uh, they are quite simple crash absorbers made in in steel components that are built with folded zones the crash absorbers built in honeycomb structures in uh, uh, high pure uh, aluminium. They need to make it in very pure aluminium 
because uh, to extrude such a complex shape uh, in uh, alloyed aluminium is uh, is impossible due to the uh, mechanical properties. So, but so only very pure aluminium can be formed in into these shapes. Also, metal foams are used, uh, and they can be built into systems like this. Uh, if you look at trains, you have crash absorbers in the front, you have crash absorbers in in, in different places uh, all over uh, uh, the, the transport sectors. So therefore, we uh, try to, to develop uh, this uh, crash absorbing system. But we also had other possibilities. We also looked at heat exchanger or could we heat up water, make a boiler out of it? Um, if we look at crash absorption, it's not alone the front of the car. Uh, some years ago uh, on, on YouTube, uh, a lot of uh, videos came out with uh, electrical cars suddenly starting to burn because uh, they had uh, ran over uh, obstacles in the car, uh, a rock or a plate uh, that uh, punctured the, the bottom of the car and therefore punctured the batteries. And when air came into a punctured battery, uh, it started to burn. So we could also see a potential in protecting batteries uh, with a crash absorption system. And if we could use a system like this, uh, where we have channels, maybe the channels could be uh, integrated with the cooling. So we had a dual uh, property of, uh, of, of the product. And what kind of material should we use? Um, when, when I went to school back in the 90s, mechanical properties were only shown as the banana. Uh, we called it. Uh, so you could either have very high strength materials, but no ductility, or you could have high ductility materials with almost no strength. But uh, over the last uh, 15 years, uh, new alloy systems has been developed uh, called TWIP. And TWIP is twinning induced plasticity. And twinning induced plasticity means that uh, when you make the formation of an austenitic uh, structure, uh, if, if you have a change in the microstructure to another uh, uh, so-called microstructure, not uh, a ferritic structure instead of austenitic, then it's called trip. But if the deformation is captured as twins, then it's called TWIP. So we are trying to capture uh, what is called uh, the, the, the TWIP. And as you can see here on the picture, uh, TWIP can make a very strong combination of uh, elongation and, and strength. Um, why is that interesting in, uh, in, in a crash absorber? It is because if you look at the, the working diagram, the area below the curve is the energy uh, that is absorbed by the deformation. Uh, so here, if we have a, this could be an aluminium alloy uh, strength around 200, 250, elongation 45%. So the energy is the area you see below here. But if we take a trip that has a, uh, 0.2 strength around uh, 550, and then it just continues to to elongate up to around 45 percent. Then the area below here is up to 10 times higher than uh, than the energy absorption we see in in aluminium. So that's why twip steelers are so interesting as as crash, crash absorbers. Uh, and if we look at different uh, alloys, uh, steel alloys used in cars, uh, then you can see over the last 20, 30 years, 
uh, the energy absorption rate has just grown, grown, grown. And today, trip steels are used in cars, uh, in, in the front zones and in the uh, high power impact uh, adapter zones in, in, in the car structures. So how do we do that when we turn it into metal powder and, and not the cake I started to show? Yeah, we have initially a base powder uh, where we add the alloying animals, elements and we add uh, the binder system. Then we mix everything uh, and when it's mixed, it's like clay. So you can form it and shape it like clay and therefore you can press it through a die, as you see here, uh, and it comes out. When it's out here, uh, it's still dry, uh, it's, it's not dry, it's still wet, and we, we call that a green part. Uh, after that, uh, yeah, uh, and the properties as green part is that it's very important that it doesn't collapse. Uh, that's the most difficult part of, uh, of of the shaping process. It's to uh, ensure that it does not collapse because we're working with wall thickness down to 0.4 millimeters. So it's, it, it's quite difficult because the metal itself is very heavy. So gravity uh, would like to make this collapse down. Uh, then after uh, the shape has been given, we need to dry out the part. And uh, after drying, it's called a brown part. Uh, and after that, we add it to the furnace. In the beginning of the furnace, we we move uh, the lubricant, the binder system. Then we reduce the oxides, and then we have the sindering going on. Uh, then we have the cooling zone, and if we control the cooling zone, you can heat treat it and uh, and, and secure that you have the right uh, microstructure uh, of, of the part. Um, so the process itself from shaping and all the way through sintering is more or less a standard sintering uh, process. Uh, you could say the main difference is that if you do it, uh, uh, in a continuous sintering uh, furnace, uh, these very long parts uh, can be very difficult to make because the tip of the part, if they go through the furnace, uh, will see another uh, thermal history than the back of the part that comes in later. Uh, so therefore, to, to do this is quite tricky as well. And when we center the the particles that are in the, you, you could recognize these particles from the gas atomized powder I, I showed in one of the previous slides. Uh, they start to to glow together, and uh, the binding together is not uh, it's not melting. We do not see liquid phase, but uh, it is uh, what we call uh, a centering. Uh, and, uh, and you might have done it this winter, uh, in, uh, at least here in Denmark, we had a lot of snow. And uh, when we have degrees below zero, you can still pick up uh, the snow and press it together to a snowball. If you just press it and you heat it a little, then it starts to center together. So that's what we call water centering. Uh, if you go not zero degrees, but if you go 1300 degrees, then we call that uh, steel sindering. Uh, some of you might also know the process binder jetting. Uh, I, I briefly talked about it uh, when, when talking about the, the powder and application for it. And if you take uh, and, and substitute the extrusion process with binder jet, it is, in fact, uh, the same process that uh, that we go through. So there are a lot of similarities in in how we work with uh, with the powders. Then we dig a little deeper into the products. If you look at the uh, the microstructure to the left, 
you can see that in the core there are some small black spots. Uh, that's uh, porosities, uh, but the surface is quite dense. Uh, this part has been uh, debinded in air. Uh, if we look at the other side, uh, which uh, has a lot of porosities going all the way through, you can see it's 11 volume percent porosity, where the first one is only 3%. Uh, that has been debound in hydrogen. So what is going on? Why do debinding have such a strong influence on the final structure? Because if we want strength in a crash absorber, uh, it is uh, quite obvious that a uh, product that, that looks like like this with high density has a lot better strength than the one filled up with porosities. Uh, in fact, it is known that uh, if we take this with 11% uh, porosities and you put that in into this curve, you can see that the blue line is 11% uh, more or less uh, it should be had have been out here. I can see this is only nine percent. Um, but then the the strength the tensile strength itself is reduced linearly with the porosity. But a figure uh, figure as the elongation is reduced uh, dramatically. Uh, so this component is expected not to have elongation at fifty percent, but maybe only ten to fifteen. Uh, then we need to understand what is going on inside this material. And uh, if we look deeper into the, uh, uh, the phase diagram of, of this alloy, uh, this is an alloy uh, with 16% uh, uh, manganese, 40% uh, chromium, a little silicon, and then we add some nitrogen in our heat treatment process. Uh, and you can see this has a, a quite large uh, austenitic phase. But up here, uh, we have a delta uh, ferrite phase. And uh, when sintering, we know that uh, activity during sintering, uh, the movability of iron atoms is about five to ten times higher in the ferritic phase than it is into austenitic phase. So if we want to have a high uh, density, we would love to center in this area. And you can see 1300 degrees that I just uh, talked about previously is just within this spec. So we would like to be up here. Uh, but we can also see that if we have too high uh, carbon content. If you have 0.1%, then we are out in the uh, full austenitic zone, and therefore we will have uh, low uh, activity during sintering. Um, then we can also look at uh, the heat treatment itself. I'll just move that away. Uh, we would like 0.3% uh, into the material. And if we uh, have, uh, this is number one, two, three, the third line represent 10% uh, nitrogen in, in the atmosphere, then you could see we should be heat treating at a temperature just below 1200 degrees to have an equilibrium with the 0.3%. Uh, so that's also a way to, to play with it. And it, it of course shows the sensitivity in, uh, in the alloy composition. Uh, we, oh, I'll just jump back to that one because when we see uh, these two again, uh, 
uh, the hydrogen debound material. Uh, when debinding with hydrogen, it's very difficult to remove uh, the entire binder system. Uh, the decomposition is uh, is not full, so therefore we typically end up with around 0.15% uh, a, a carbon remaining. Where when we debind in air, we fully debind, and therefore we have uh, non-carbon left in in the microstructure. And if we look into the phase year diagram, 0.15 centering uh, around 13, 13, 15, then we are in full uh, authentic phase and do not have this activity as, uh, as we need to have a, a higher density. Then, does it work as a crash absorber? Uh, I have a, a short video showing uh, a structure that is smashed. And uh, if you look, very closely, you can see all the folding zones. Um, so the structure itself, uh, when it's shaped like a honeycomb, is ideal uh, because we use such a large amount of the material to deform. It's not only one point bending, but it bends all over. So therefore, uh, the absorption of such a system is is extremely high. Uh, and if we look at uh, some tests that were done for us, uh, the specific energy absorption ended around 50 kilojoule per kilo of material, uh, where uh, a typical uh, unit for crass absorption is between five and 10. So we have proven that uh, that it works. Uh, but now we need uh, some volumes to, uh, to, to uh, we need to find some volumes on the market to bring this out. Uh, because to, to invest in production equipment is, uh, is, is not that easy. Uh, so we're looking for uh, somebody who are interested in uh, trying this to protect their batteries or to protect their uh, their car in general uh, with a trip shaped uh, crash absorber system like uh, like just shown to you. But then I take the last jump of today. Uh, where uh, where we're looking for uh, an entirely different application uh, because when looking at how could we uh, really make an impact in uh, in saving the world and reducing carbon emission uh, we looked into the steel production and steel is today manufactured mainly in uh, in big blast furnaces uh, in Europe, about 60% uh, of all steel is manufactured with, from uh, iron ore uh, in blast furnaces, uh, and the remaining 40% is uh, recycled electro-melted steel. But when we look other places in the world, uh, the, uh, the blast furnaces are uh, taking the majority. And that uh, means that 70% 7 7 of uh, the carbon emission in the world are produced uh, in, uh, in blast furnaces. Um, yeah, okay, but we are producing 2 billion tons of iron, so it is not fair. Yeah, maybe, but uh, the amount is growing. Uh, and I have seen forecasts saying that within uh, the next 10 years, uh, the annual production will be closer to 3 billion tons uh, per year. And that will be built mainly in blast furnaces. So this number will just grow. Um, but there is another path uh, to produce iron uh, from iron ore. It's called uh, direct reduction iron. It's a quite old process. Uh, I have seen literature uh, back to the 60s uh, telling about uh, DRI uh, and the the old way of making it is to 
produce syngas. Uh, syngas is cracked uh, natural gas typically. Then it is heated and uh, shown here, it's a fuel heater, so it's burned with natural gas. It's heated to typical uh, 1000 degrees, added to the iron ore, and because the syngas is a strong reducing gas, uh, mainly containing of hydrogen and uh, carbon monoxide, it reduces the iron ore, and out at the bottom you have uh, what is called iron pellets that can be uh, remelted in uh, an electromelt. But if you instead exchange the fire heater here with electrical heating, uh, you could uh, save uh, a lot of energy, uh, or you could turn a lot of that energy in uh, in in a heat uh, or, or into electrical heating. Uh, so therefore, we have uh, built a test facility where we are testing uh, these structures as heating elements. Uh, because instead of heating uh, electrically with a standard heating element where you only heat uh, the, the gas on this on the outer surface, in these we have an inner surface that is up to 20 times higher than the outer surface. So it means that uh, we have extremely high power density uh, if we heat up gas uh, uh, with as, as a convection heater in, in, in this. Um, when we do that, uh, if we only have this structure, uh, we can heat it up extremely fast because we have no ceramics, we have no support. We need to heat up, or we don't, and we don't need to shield it, shield it when cooling down. So therefore, we made uh, trials heating up, cooling down. So heating up is the blue, uh, where you can see we can heat up to to stable temperature within uh, three to four minutes. Uh, then we can turn off the power and then we can cool down from high temperature to room temperature within three minutes again. Uh, so it's extremely thermal shock stable. Uh, because we have such a short distance from the heat and to the gas we, we need to heat, uh, we don't need that high superheat either. That means that we can heat up the gas to a higher temperature than you, you typically, typically can when, when you run with electrical heating. Uh, and then we can change the geometry because the geometry is just based on the uh, tools uh, for, for the shaping uh, that you saw uh, previously. Uh, and finally, we can go into all kinds of alloy systems where we're doing that, this. Uh, today we are making these structures in uh, FECRA alloy uh, system, so the iron, chromium, aluminium alloy uh, that is feasible for, for high temperatures. Uh, but we have also been working in the trip steels, the manganese uh, based, as you saw previously, and we have made uh, high alloy stainless steel. So a lot of uh, uh, freedom in, in making it with different alloy systems. Uh, and the potential applications we have been looking at are what uh, is called hard to abate industries. Uh, we're looking at the DRI process. We are looking into aluminum calcination to calcium carbonate calcination for making uh, cement. Uh, we're looking into uh, traditional brick firing because brick firing uh, is also removing the crystal bound water. And when you burn with a gas burner, you introduce a lot of water into the system. Uh, and if you look at the thermodynamics uh, to remove water with water, then you just need higher temperature or you need a little more time. Uh, but if you remove water with extremely dry air, uh, you don't need that much energy. So it can also be uh, more efficient. And we're looking into afterburners, we're looking into tantis preheaters, uh, convection furnaces that could be for uh, aluminium heat treatment, uh, because aluminium is heat treated at a, a temperature 
around five to 600 degrees, and their radiation is not really powerful. Uh, so therefore you need convection to, to transfer a large amount of energies uh, and hopefully many more. So that's uh, where uh, we're looking for, for, for you to help us to find the, the next application for, for these uh, metal powder through products. So the conclusion of my, my presentation today, uh, I have shown that the uh, powder metallurgy is a very strong platform for innovation on both alloy systems. You can design the alloys almost as you want. In fact, you can mix uh, very high melting temperature materials with low melting temperature uh, materials and, and still have a, a product out of it. You can make extremely complex designs. Uh, yeah, we have over the last years uh, introduced two new, uh, very interesting processes, the additive manufacturing and now the metal powder extrusion. And uh, we uh, expect that this could lead to uh, very new applications out there. So, um, and then I have a, a last question for you. Uh, we, we have this scheme showing where does the, the different processes fit in. And, and you could see the 3D printing, the additive manufacturing has very high complexity. Uh, but the quantity, the numbers you can produce annually and be competitive is still not very high. Where if you go high in, in, in numbers and high complexity, metal injection molding is, is maybe the winner. Uh, we are working to push this downwards and push this upwards to make them meet each, each other in, in this spec. But uh, where in this picture would you place the uh, metal uh, power extrusion process? Carlos? Oh, hi there. I just I was amazing yeah. myself. <laughs> um, um, uh, hi, Peter. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the presentation. That was really interesting. Um, Thank you, Carlos. Uh, I've seen that, you know, like, as you mentioned, you know, the metal powder extrusion, uh, well, I guess one of the, the main attractives is that the flexibility of the manufacturing of it, so you can get any any shape you want. I mean, I mean, any shape, as long as it's extrusion, but you can get a, mm. any section that you, you would like to do. And so uh, what are the, the limitations in, in terms of tolerances or, or well, thicknesses? I, I think you mentioned that you mm. could go down up down to 0.5 millimeters yeah 0.4 millimeter wall thickness is uh, is the level we are at today and and that is the limit downwards uh, otherwise uh, the product will just collapse mm -hmm. okay I see. Um, yeah yeah but but you could easily go up in wall thickness um, yeah but but then the material consumption will just be a lot higher, and uh, in in the the heating application as the the last one I showed, uh, we would like to have as little material as possible to have uh, the resistivity as high as possible. Mm -hmm. All right, and and how repeatable is then? Um, you know, once you get the product, is like is. Uh, is yeah. is the, the the tolerance uh, I, because from the pictures you shown it, it looks quite mm. neat in the results. <laughs> so yes. that, like those filters um, that you showed at the the beginning and and those crash yeah. columns as well. Yeah, uh, there are uh, tolerances, uh, and the products uh, that you have seen today are made on our prototype setup. So it's uh, it's made on uh, low cost home built uh, equipment. Uh, we have just invested, we are building now uh, a new factory uh, because we are, uh, we, we have our first customer that will go into uh, high volume uh, later this year. Um, and therefore we are right now running in uh, new uh, industrialized equipment. And we have seen extremely nice tolerances uh, on, on these, on the manufacturability. Uh, of course, during sintering, uh, 
these uh, products, uh, they, they have a quite high sh shrinkage rate. So typical shrinkage is 14 to 17% linearly. Uh, so therefore, tolerances are higher than uh, machine parts. But I would say we, we are reaching for a tolerance spec that is 0.5% uh, of the nominal nominal uh, length of uh, of the parts. All right. Well, I think thanks very much for that, Peter. Yeah, I, I, yeah. What well, you mentioned about batteries, I think that does looks quite promising. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Harry. Please. Yeah, so thank you for that uh, nice presentation. Um, so I'm not from Warwick University, but at Warwick University, I've seen uh, measurements of the crash uh, energy absorption for different materials. So for example, uh, obviously steel, but mm. also um, composites. And I have some movies of those. Uh, what is your comparison of the TWIP device in terms of energy absorption uh, versus uh, what's already there? Uh, the the figure where I show this uh, energy absorption around 50 uh, kilojoule per kilo, uh, I I compare that to uh, what is state of the art today or standard in the industry today around five to ten kilojoule per kilo, uh, and I would say the main difference is that uh, the geometry of these components uh, enables us to use such a large amount of the material. So it's not only uh, uh, a fraction of the material that deforms, it's 90% of the material that is deformed. So therefore the, the energy absorption curve that we see is driven by the geometry and it's not driven by the alloy itself. And uh, if you if you take your 50 kilojoules per kilogram, um, we also need to think about the absolute weight. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of energy to be absorbed, but what is the absolute weight of your component compared with? Yeah, mm. yeah, compared with uh, the, uh, yeah, because you, uh, yeah, you're right. You, I, I think you you say you need to build it into something. You need to build it into a structure. And the structure itself also has a weight. Um, uh, we we haven't calculated on that. Uh, we have only been measuring on the raw products uh, so far. Okay. Uh, well, well, one final uh, speculation, if you like. Okay. Yeah. So in the future, you know, we will have cars which will have uh, sensors around them. So effectively, you have a, a shield, so you don't get a collision. Mm -hmm. In which case, you know, you could make the car out of cardboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a possibility, you know, a real possibility, actually. Um, I, I'm not that sure about it, uh, because uh, uh, most accidents, uh, I don't think they could be avoided with, with sensors. So if there is a uh a, a piece uh, of uh, uh what a, an exhaust pipe a car has dropped on the street and you are driving over it uh with a uh, 100 kilometer per hour and just the the wind makes it rise and suddenly it hits the bottom of your car and it punctures your uh, your battery uh, you you cannot avoid that with sensors. Uh, well, you can because you. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming an ideal scenario. You know, you have sensors mm. which will detect this before you. Yeah. To. But then, um, I would say on a windy day in Denmark, no cars <laughs> could drive at all because then you'll have uh, <laughs> wood sticks and branches all over the street, so you you were not able to drive uh, 200 meters before the sensor will stop your car. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we just any... get rid of cars, you know, we go by train, okay? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we will. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Yeah. 
Hi there. Thanks ever so much for the talk. I just have a, a, a quick question. Um, I love the, the concept. It, it's really nice. But I was wondering, what's the limitation on joining? So some of these component mm -hmm. parts would need to be joined into a full structure. Yes. Um, and obviously, the automotive industry does tend to rely on welding. I was just yep. wondering what the, the limitations or the opportunities are for the joining. You are uh, spot on uh, one of the big issues. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just jump back. Uh, do you still see my screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if if you look at this, you can see here uh, the, the the electrical power is transferred from the bottom up through the uh, the honeycomb structure. Then we have a bridge here, and we have another bridge here. And you can see the thickness of this bridge, it's around 10 millimeters, where the wall thickness of the structure is 0.4. And uh, what you see down here is the welding. So we have welded uh, 0.4 millimeter, uh, extremely difficult material to weld together with a 10 millimeter thick uh, uh, plate. Uh, it is possible to weld, but uh, uh, I would say the the welding has caused us uh, as many uh, gray hairs as the extrusion process itself. Um, we have a, a one way to mitigate on that, uh, at least some of the way, uh, and that is to make the products longer. Because the longer we can make them, the less weldings we need. Um, but uh, so far, we are limited to a length of uh, 30 centimeters, uh, because that is the limit of uh, of our furnace where we can cinder it. But we can extrude uh, more than a meter. So it's uh, just a simple question of uh, scaling up. But um, I uh, I don't know how uh, a component one meter long, how that will shrink uh, when it centers and we have a shrinkage rate uh, on on almost twenty percentage. Uh, then it will it will move twenty uh, centimeters somewhere. Uh, so coming back to Carlos's question on tolerances, ooh, <laughs> that would be a uh, a difficult one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, um, often these things, it's it's that practicality of then translating it into the component part. I think the the properties mm -hmm. are superb, but these practicalities of, of translation. But thank you very much indeed. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. Uh, welding is a, an extremely important issue, and that's why we have uh, put a lot of uh, of force into solving that. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? If uh, no more questions, once again, uh, I take this opportunity on behalf of our group to thank Peter.